She was altruistic and totally ambitious to attract the attention of the world. She was a genius. Nobody before her had the audacity to try to do a global reinterpretation of spirituality the way that she did. At a time when women, like children, were expected to be seen and not heard, it was said that she left her husband to become a trick rider in the circus. Traveling alone, she entered forbidden Tibet. She was a spiritual genius and the mother of the new age. On the other hand, there are those who say she was a fraud, whose one real talent was that she knew how to tell a good tale. A magnetic personality. She was a good storyteller. A fascinating conversationalist who attracted people everywhere she went. Given her lifelong concern with things mystical, metaphysical, and spiritual, it's perhaps surprising to discover that she had an effect on the world we know in ways we could hardly imagine. Nobody else could give what she gave to the world. Elena Petrovna Blavatsky, Madame Blavatsky, HPB, whatever you call her, she was a larger-than-life woman, a true spiritual traveler. Few would contest her right to be called the mother of the new age. Before HPB, every right-thinking European knew that the religions of the East were superstitions followed by gullible members of lesser races. Blavatsky would make it commonplace to see Eastern religions, Hinduism and Buddhism as important sacred teachings that some might consider superior to those of the Christian West. East and West live much closer today than HPB's contemporaries could have ever dreamed. It's not just that you can eat a hamburger in Singapore or dim sum in Toronto. The roads built by exploitation, colonization, and commerce became the highways of intercultural exchange. Please take a moment first to thank yourself for practicing yoga today. Few in the Toronto of the 19th century would have ever heard of yoga, let alone practiced it. For taking this time to connect with yourself and the world around you. Today, in almost any city on the planet, you can choose between dozens of flavors of this ancient physical and mystical practice of India. Whether you prefer it stripped of religious implications or in a more traditional form, you can buy your specialized yoga clothes, slippers, pillow or mat, and none of your friends will even blink an eye. It's not just yoga that has become part of Western life. It's everything from crystals to religious icons to books on esoteric secrets of the East and West. Not that long ago, these concepts would have seemed very odd to us indeed. The most important thing about Blavatsky is her role in trying to synthesize a global spirituality that explains all religions. That's something that is almost standard now among New Age gurus of various sorts, but she was the first person who took on the task of trying to explain the entire gamut of human spirituality and to embody what she had learned in the course of studying all these religious traditions in a spiritual path that somehow transcended and incorporated all of them. There is a road, steep and thorny, beset with perils of every kind, but yet a road, and it leads to the heart of the universe. I can tell you how to find those who will show you the secret gateway that leads inward only. For those who win onwards, there is reward past all telling, the power to bless and save humanity. For those who fail, there are other lives in which success may come. This woman who was ahead of her time, who had an impact on our world in far-reaching ways, began life as Helena Petrovna von Hahn. She was born in what is today the Ukraine in 1831. She came from a fairly prominent family. Her father was a military officer who was frequently away from home and sometimes took the family with him to far-flung spots in the expanding Russian Empire. 
Her mother was one of Russia's most respected writers, and because she wrote about women and what a miserable lives they had, uh, she was known as the Russian George Sand. Uh, she showed some tendency towards what we would call psychic phenomena and was a rather impetuous child, very independent-minded. She was beginning in childhood, but more in adolescence, also exposed to Russian occultism in the form of Freemasonry and Rosicrucianism because her great-grandfather had a vast library that in her later recollections she said she had devoured every book in. It could be that this is where she got much of her knowledge that uh, she was famous for in later life. So Blavatsky had a taste for the exotic from very early childhood because of the cosmopolitan circumstances of her family. As a child, Helena displayed unusual behavior. She had disturbing visions, spoke to invisible playmates, and told stories of exotic adventures where she was the heroine. These stories were so vivid that her sister was sure she must have really had these experiences, perhaps in a previous incarnation. Her family was often concerned about her future. About age 17, so the story goes, she was taunted by an English governess uh, that nobody would be interested in her because she, had, uh, she was temperamental, she was difficult to get along with, she was extremely willful. And she said, well, even old Blavatsky over here, the plumeless raven, would never be interested. He was a man, so far as we understand, was about 39 years old at the time, so he was over twice her age. Anyway, she uh, took the dare, or however it was, and uh, the proposal came, and they were married, but she was not interested in being anybody's wife. And it only lasted a couple of months, and off she went. Um, beginning 20 years, really, of, of world travel. The question of who, what, where is God, and who, what was the immortal spirit of man? This was a, a question that had always troubled her. So whether it was a romantic infatuation or a spiritual one, she had begun to conceive of herself as wanting to travel in pursuit of spiritual mysteries and truth. She would have been one of the very, very few women who traveled uh, alone. Her behavior was totally outside the norm, outside boundaries for a woman in that um, century, unless the person happened to be a queen or someone who was in a, an inherited position of authority. There's not much said about what she was doing, except that she apparently went to those locations where the esoteric or occult knowledge was prominent. Uh, she traveled to India, uh, in the Far East. She uh, traveled to America, North and South, investigating mystic traditions the world around. Deeply interested in the beliefs and cultures of the world, HPB's journeys were extensive. In trying to piece together the events of her life, more often than not, we encounter conflicting stories. Her own accounts are sometimes vastly different than those of others. One of the stories she told about herself was that she had been a soldier. And she had been a soldier in the army of Giuseppe Garibaldi, who was fighting in those years trying to unify Italy. In this Battle of Montana, which was uh, 1867, uh, Garibaldi lost. Now, Madame Blavatsky said that she had been severely wounded in the battle, and she had been left for dead on the battlefield. She loved to tell this story, and it was very dramatic, and sometimes she'd even show scars and everything. Her next phase was wandering mostly in Eastern Europe in the company of a man named Agardi Mitrovic, who was a Hungarian opera singer and also a political radical who involved her in the struggle against the Catholic domination of Italy. He got a job uh, with a touring company or a job at the in Cairo, probably with the Cairo Opera House. 
They got on a ship. There were 400 passengers on it, and it had um, a cargo in part of gunpowder. And uh, the ship blew up off the coast of Greece. Um, a guardy went down with the ship. Most of the people went down with the ship. Uh, Volvatsky survived. So there she was at uh, the age of about 40. She didn't have any support again. She went on to Cairo, and she uh, tried to establish a life for herself there. And how she supported herself was giving seances. She connected with the community there uh, that were into paranormal phenomenon. She tried to be a medium. Although very interested in spiritualism, HPB's understanding of the phenomena was somewhat different than her fellow mediums. But she did explore this world and produced many manifestations. She could slow time down. Uh, some other examples where she could make things appear or disappear. Uh, yes, so all of these were uh, demonstrated by her. Whether these were tricks or not, um, many would probably say they were. Madame Blavatsky continued her spiritual journey and set sail for the United States. She joined the hundreds of thousands of people at that time in the 1870s who were going to America. America was the place to go. At that time, spiritualism was a very exciting subject to Americans. People were open to the ideas of the paranormal, people with psychic ability who were touring on the vaudeville circuit, People lined up to, to see their performances, to attend their seances. And I think she probably thought this, this would be someplace where they, would, they might find me interesting. And they did. Upon her arrival in New York, Blavatsky was virtually penniless. She had occasional income from the family, but she had to work. She worked making artificial flowers in a factory. She was looking for, for a way that she could uh, continue to survive. When she read in the paper stories written by a man named Henry Olcott. Henry Steele Olcott was a respected member of New York society. He had worked for the New York Tribune, was a special investigator on corruption during the Civil War, and was one of a three-member panel appointed to investigate the assassination of President Lincoln. He was also a lawyer with a prosperous business in New York City. With a lingering interest in spiritualism from his youth, Alcott decided to investigate some intriguing spirit manifestations that were occurring at a farmhouse in Vermont. Convinced of the validity of the spirits, he wrote an account of his observations for the New York papers. He then headed back to the farmhouse to investigate the phenomena further. It was a farm run by two brothers named Eddie, the Eddie brothers, who were mediums, and they were giving these seances. People from New York or wherever would come up. Uh, they could uh, stay there. They had room and board, and in the evening, they could uh, attend the performances. Their home became a gathering place for spiritualists to witness physical phenomena. So entities would appear and walk around the room and be touched by the persons in attendance. The heyday of, of spiritualism involved physical manifestations and the Eddie brothers were famous for providing a plethora of unusual and fascinating appearances. Madame Blavatsky was intrigued both by a desire to continue her investigation into spiritualist phenomena and perhaps to meet the author of these interesting articles. She was driven by the desire for fame constantly, even when it was not in her interest to thrust herself into the headlines. 
So she was at this Eddie Brothers farm. According to Alcott, HPB certainly stood out in a crowd. My eye was first attracted by a scarlet Garibaldian shirt she wore, as in vivid contrast with the dull colors around. Her hair was a thick blonde mop, worn shorter than the shoulders, and it stood out from her head, silken soft and crinkled to the roots. I whispered to my companion, Good gracious, look at that specimen, will you? Alcott recalled that Madame Blavatsky went outside and rolled herself a cigarette. He walked over to her and said, Permettez-moi, madame, and offered her a light. Later he said that their acquaintance began in smoke, but it stirred up a great and permanent fire. He thought she was fascinating. She told him all stories about being wounded with Garibaldi, <laughs> and she had on kind of beatnik clothes. She wasn't unattractive. She was not as obese as she became later in life, but she was... She was an, uh, a nice-looking middle-aged woman who was dressed peculiarly. Uh, he thought she was the most fascinating person he had ever met. Not only was Alcott's first meeting with Blavatsky memorable, but the manifestations they experienced together at the Eddy farm convinced him of how extraordinary she was. According to HPB, the spirits they encountered during their seances were numerous, and many were familiar to her. There was a Georgian boy, dressed in the historical Caucasian attire. I recognized and questioned him in Georgian upon circumstances known only to myself. I was understood and answered. A little old man appears. He is dressed as Persian merchants generally are. His dress is perfect as a national costume. He speaks his name in a loud whisper. It is an old man whom I and my family have known for 20 years at Tiflis. He says, half in Georgian and half in Persian, that he has got a big secret to tell me, and comes at three different times, vainly seeking to finish his sentence. A man of gigantic stature emerges forth, dressed in the picturesque attire of the warriors of Kurdistan. He does not speak, but bows in the oriental fashion, and lifts up his spear, ornamented with bright-colored feathers, shaking it in token of welcome. An old woman appears with a Russian headgear. She comes out and addresses me in Russian, calling me by an endearing term that she used in my childhood. I recognize an old servant of my family, a nurse of my sister. Their friendship solidified, and the two returned to New York. Shortly after their arrival, they moved in together, not as a couple, but more as kindred spirits. That was very unusual. There was no sexual um, contact with them as far as is known. They were like comrades or brother and sister or professional colleagues. In fact, they liked each other enormously. They got on and there was a, a great affection there. She only became a spiritual teacher after she made the crucial connection with Henry Steele Alcott, who at the time was a prominent spiritualist and who became her entree to the world of New York spiritualism. She begins to write letters to the editor, either defending spiritualists or attacking their critics, making a name for herself in the spiritualist press where Alcott is already fairly well known. I am here in this country sent by my lodge on behalf of truth and modern spiritualism, and it is my most sacred duty to unveil what it is and expose what it is not. Perhaps did I arrive here 100 years too soon? Maybe. And I'm afraid it is so, for people seem to care every day less for truth and every hour more for gold. My feeble protest in endeavors will be of no avail. Nevertheless, I am ever ready for the grand battle and perfectly prepared to bear any consequences that may fall to my lot. There was a place that they stayed called the Lamasery, in which uh, uh, Blavatsky had a department uh, loaded with some of her collections from India and elsewhere. And she would hold soirees 
and tell stories. And, and she very quickly became very well known amongst the elite and the intellectuals. Blavatsky starts to become a book author in her own right, slowly beginning to work on what became Isis Unveiled. This was HPB's first major work and offers her insights on both Eastern and Western religion and philosophy. Alcott was her collaborator in the writing process, which involved many strange phenomena which convinced him that she was being assisted by invisible helpers, not only in the spirit world, but living men elsewhere who were communicating te telepathically or occupying her body and writing through her. Blavatsky explained that these invisible helpers were adepts or masters who are part of a brotherhood of enlightened spiritual beings. Alcott talks about hands appearing mysteriously in writing during the night while she's asleep. The composition process of Isis Unveiled is only the first instance where the authorship of items that appear under her name is somewhat confused because both she and Alcott say that there were many others helping behind the scenes. She started writing and she said, well, I, I get it from my masters. They're dictating to me or I see it in, in the astral light, the inner worlds. And uh, I remember when I first read that, I said, oh, yeah, right. And I found myself very soon running back for, an, for a glossary because the terminology was, was a huge barrier. I didn't know what all this Eastern philosophical terminology meant. And yet here was a person who was touching every conceivable subject of importance in areas of religion and philosophy and science, uh, written with knowledge. And I said, how can a person know so much about so many things and handle it uh, uh, with skill in this way? But I just didn't know. HPB communicated mainly with two masters, Moria and Kuthumi. These people lived in Tibet, but they weren't Tibetans. They were Indians. And the Brotherhood had picked her to disseminate their ideas as much as they want to reveal to the world through the madam. They feel they can do more for the world by not being visible personalities. And there, is, there has been a lot of interesting developments of that idea where one hears about ascended masters and so forth. Um, they themselves say, no, no, we're fully physical. Uh, we are what we are by virtue of our training. Uh, we have spent our lifetime uh, pursuing uh, spiritual and philosophical and, and uh, scientific questions. And we feel that we have some answers that we can provide that help humanity to understand what they are, where they came from. The answers to the questions of ultimate concern. These masters are more spiritually evolved. That means that they can live longer, hundreds of years. Uh, they have much more knowledge. They are almost, um, if you can use an analogy, almost uh, 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 resembling, we might say, the hidden hand theory, which means that behind this world, there is a small cadre of individuals who are controlling things. And so these masters are... Uh, in separate brotherhoods in India, in Egypt, and elsewhere, who are helping to perhaps uh, control the progress of the planet and spreading the wisdom. While living in New York, many guests visited the Lamasery and were entertained and intrigued by HPB's stories. They were also touched by something profoundly important in her words. Uh, the two of them had many discussions, and they also had many visitors to their apartment. People who were also interested in the occult, who found everything that Madame had to say very interesting. And at some point, uh, Alcott said to this little group, wouldn't it be 
uh, useful to form a club or a society to study the occult phenomenon further. And uh, Man Vlasti said, yes, that's a very good idea. The Theosophical Society was formed in 1875 and still exists today with branches all over the world. And the, uh, the original objective of the society was very simple, one, one sentence long, to collect and diffuse a knowledge of the laws of the universe, period. Once a student abandons the old trodden highway of routine and enters upon the solitary path of independent thought, Godward, he is a theosophist, an original thinker, a seeker after the eternal truth with an inspiration of his own to solve the universal problems. According to HPB, theosophy or divine wisdom refers to the ultimate truth of the supreme, the cosmos, and humanity. It is a truth that has existed from the dawn of time. Theosophy is some way a connection between the world and the divine. And what is in the world reflects the divine and is the divine. So the idea is a unified teaching in which everything literally is God. There has been some question about how the masters communicated with HPB from their home in Tibet. Along with Alcott, many of Blavatsky's followers claim to see these masters as well. Some explain this as examples of astral projection. There is quite a bit mentioned about out-of-body experiences or astral projection. So it could very well be that this was the true purpose of the society. How do you, in fact, um, go beyond your, your ordinary imperfect self and become perfected, to become an adept, for instance. And it, it seems to me that if you put this together with the notion of the masters, it could very well be that the masters were perceived to be human beings who projected themselves out of the body. And that was the reason why they can go literally anywhere in the world to communicate with individuals. That is the reason why uh, masters were not looked upon with skepticism, that, that they did have this ability and that they themselves, theosophists, expected to have this same ability. Perhaps this helps to explain some of the unusual phenomena that HPB was said to perform. Alcott describes her in some cases as performing phenomena that are hard to explain now, but perhaps only either genuineness or hypnosis explains her being able to physically transform her appearance into that of a man with black hair and then change back into herself. Alcott describes things like this that are just impossible to interpret but remain fascinating as to what was really going on. Isis Unveiled was published in 1877 and the first edition sold out within 10 days. Not surprisingly, the reviews were mixed. The New York Herald called it one of the most remarkable productions of the century, while The Sun called it discarded rubbish. Reviews aside, HPB was undoubtedly pleased her message was reaching a wider audience. Eventually, the decision was made to spread the message of theosophy further. They remained in New York until 1878, when the decision was made, probably on Alcott's advice, that they, Blavatsky and he, go to India, which he considered to be the land of the sacred wisdom, where more of the sacred wisdom could be found than any other place in the world. And that was the reason why they went. They were received uh, with open arms by the native populace, the Indians, because they were perceived to be two individuals who came to investigate their religion, not to try to convert them to Christianity, as was the usual. 
The British had ruled India since 1858. Even before then, European commercial interests had been in control. There was no lack of Indians who saw themselves through European eyes as backward heathens. The natives felt that their cultures were under assault by the West, and particularly the missionaries. And they saw Blavatsky and Alcott as very welcome allies in the struggle to revive their own cultural traditions and shake off the domination of Christianity. This was the beginning of Alcott's work to try to revive Buddhism in South and Southeast Asia. And for a large degree, Alcott was successful. Blavatsky also supposedly gave Indians a better understanding and more respect for their own culture. And it's possible to connect some dots between her admiration for the Indians and her respect for them and Indian nationalism through the uh, first half of the 20th century and the ultimate independence of India. They were the first Westerners to become Buddhists in a formal, official ceremony. There were certainly Westerners who became admirers of Buddhism before that, but never this kind of formal affiliation. Once they became established, eventually they headed over to Madras and they bought some property called Huddlestone Gardens. And that became the future headquarters of the Theosophical Society. It was around this time that they met A.P. Sinet, who was to become a very important figure later on in the society. Sinet was the editor of the Pioneer, and he publicized the coming of the two Theosophists and he had, after meeting Blavatsky, some questions about theosophy, what the teaching was all about, and apparently was contacted by a master through a letter. And out of this came a correspondence that lasted from about 1880 to 1886. The number of letters it was about 145 that were exchanged. All of these letters were written either by Kutumi or Moria. Sinet was not the only one who received letters from the masters. There were those who believed wholeheartedly in their authenticity. Others had their doubts. She did miracles like crazy. The letters from Kutumi giving instructions to her or just giving information were flying like crazy. They landed on people's heads. They uh, landed um, next to them on a table. Uh, the letters sometimes came through the mail. Whoever she wished to influence or wished to convince that she was who she said she was came through these letters, which I referred to uh, not really facetiously, but as the astral post office. Uh, people were, a, a lot of these people, like Alfred Sinnott, were people who were almost like Alcott. They wanted very badly to believe in what she said. They also didn't want to be made to seem like fools. So their job was to, to keep their own beliefs, to support her, to prop her up, and to try to convince everyone that, yes, she was right, yes, there were this, this brotherhood, because the idea of the brotherhood was very in, intriguing. And in a way, it still is. I mean, the idea of a, a group that's looking out for the best interests of the world, that reincarnate when the world needs them, someone who's keeping track of things. It's not just all chaos. Now, the big question is, were these letters genuine? Were they actually written by masters from Tibet or India? Or were they frauds? The allegations of fraud that are best known and best founded in my conclusion are those associated with something called the Shrine Room that was in the Adyar headquarters. 
And there, there was a room, the wall of which was a wooden cabinet where letters from the masters would appear. Miraculously, in that, a person would speak some concern or question, and then a letter answering that would appear within minutes, and they would open the door, and there the letter would be. It did not take long for suspicions to arise, and when two household employees, uh, Alexis and Emma Coulomb, confessed to a Christian magazine that they had assisted Blavatsky in fraudulent phenomena, stuffing these letters through a hole in the wall behind the shrine. This caused an uproar where the, the whole business of receiving letters from the masters became the center of the accusations against Blavatsky of fraud. When Madame Blavatsky was accused of fraud, her supporters responded immediately. They blamed the Coulombs for making the story up in retaliation for being fired. All of this occurred while Madame Blavatsky was out of the country. Whether true or not, these allegations set in motion potentially catastrophic events. She attracted the attention of a scientific group the Society for Psychical Research. This was a British group who was the closest thing there was at the time to a scientific organization that was interested in the paranormal. They were a very respectable group. They decided to investigate the Theosophical Society. They sent an investigator to India. His name was Odson. And he snooped around for months. He talked to everyone he could find. He uh, made what he felt to be very careful investigations, and he issued a report. This was Richard Hodgson's first major investigation of this kind, and many theosophists were concerned about his lack of experience. After months of what he felt was careful investigation, he concluded that there was no secret brotherhood of masters, and all the correspondence from the Mahatmas was fraudulent. The Hodgson report forever condemned Blavatsky in terms of general public perception by words that have been repeated many times ever since that one. One of the most ingenious and accomplished imposters in history. Blavatsky and Alcott both blamed each other for the sensationalism that led to the investigation and then the negative report. So while he was telling her that her sensationalism had three-fourths ruined the TS and another dose would kill it deader than a doornail, she was saying if Alcott had not made such a cult of the masters, inflaming people's imagination with tall tales about them, that the Indian followers and then the Westerners would never have become so crazed with worship of the masters that everything would have collapsed in this embarrassing humiliation. That is what she was saying, and her quote is, um, when you speak of the imaginary Mahatmas, you are right. But she's not taking responsibility herself at this point. She's saying, yes, the masters have been blown out of all proportion, and the theosophist's faith is now built on a house of sand, but it's Alcott's fault because he fanned the flames of this sensationalism, conveniently forgetting who caused Alcott to become such an enthusiast of the masters in the first place. The big turning point in the relationship of Alcott and Blavatsky, if it can be pinpointed to a single event, was Richard Hodgson showing Alcott a letter in which HPB ridiculed him and said that he was completely under her sway. She treated his belief in her as an object of contempt. And he said after reading that, he was completely distraught and contemplated suicide. Alcott begins to question what he's experienced and to say that sometimes she was deliberately misleading. Sometimes the phenomena were not genuine. He, however, never goes so far as to conclude that everything he's experienced was trickery. 
At the time, the Hodgson Report was a scandal for the Theosophical Society. 100 years later, the Society of Psychical Research formally acknowledged that the original report was badly flawed and that there were still many unanswered questions concerning the life and work of Madame Blavatsky. But the damage was done. In 1885, with a heavy heart, HPB left India for good. Alcott remained to carry on the work they had started together. With a few stops along the way, she eventually settled down in London. My heart is broken physically and morally. For the first, I do not care. Master shall take care it does not burst so long as I am needed. In the second case, there is no help. I was ready to shed the last drop of life in me, give up every hope for the last shred of, I shall not say happiness, but rest and comfort in this life of torture for the cause I serve and for every true theosophist. She again presided over a, a lodge in London that was a very hot ticket to be invited to attend. And it was not simply theosophists that came to see her, but anybody who was interested in the subjects that she discussed and in meeting a very controversial and intriguing figure. Then, in the last two years of her life, she, she drew the attention of a well-known British woman named Annie Besant. Annie Besant was a feminist, a union organizer, a a uh, writer, a um, person who uh, was enormously admired in British society. Getting the approval of a woman like Annie Besant brought her enormous number of new converts, uh, much better press than she had ever had before. Uh, Madame Blavatsky left the Theosophical Society to Annie Besant. She turned it over to her, and with that, she achieved the ultimate respectability. Her sincerity increased over the course of her career. So she learns from her mistakes. And in the last few years, when she's doing most of her writings, she's a much more careful and responsible person than she was when she was in the throes of propagandizing for theosophy and the masters and getting herself in the headlines constantly. During this period of her life, she wrote The Secret Doctrine, the synthesis of science, religion, and philosophy. This is Blavatsky's masterwork on theosophy, covering cosmic, planetary, and human evolution, as well as science, religion, and mythology. With much of her writing over the years, questions have been raised regarding source material. She was careless and can be blamed for plagiarism in terms of improper citations. But she did try to give citations and was adhering to the standards of the day as best she was able to. She never deliberately misrepresents the content of any spiritual teaching as best I can tell. And Obviously, that means that she wants to be taken seriously as somebody participating in the intellectual debates of her time. I think if her work had not been completed, she would have continued on for a while longer. It was influenza. And she was sitting in her uh, easy chair with uh, friends around her. They knew she was dying and off she went, and that simple, age 59. Every big newspaper in the United States had at least one and sometimes two articles about her death, and they were always on the front page because she, by this time, was a world celebrity. Some people didn't know what she was a celebrity for, but they knew she was famous for being famous. Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, controversial, extraordinary, larger than life, harbinger of the new age. Whether a fraud or a messenger of secret wisdom, she has touched our world and our lives forever. There are some who would just flatly reject the idea that there was any kind of trickery or dishonesty. Others who would become angry that the subject was raised, but still admit that yes, there was, but it is 
outweighed by all the positive things that she did. And then others for whom they have no difficulty acknowledging that and saying, yes, there's definitely a lot to question here, but to be a theosophist does not mean to be a follower of Blavatsky or anyone else. It means to be a seeker of divine wisdom, and that does not require belief in any claims about anything. Probably the thing that she is most well known for, and the thing that she should be known for, is a respect for Eastern culture and Eastern religion, uh, for Hinduism, Buddhism, and bringing those ideas to, to the West. The very fact that she did compare one religion with another was, in fact, I think, the beginnings of the comparative study of religion that we follow today. I feel inspired by her vision of a global spirituality. All of the Westerners who have gone East in pursuit of a sacred journey or mission are in some sense indebted to her because she's the first person who created that model of the spiritual traveler. A mystic force is rising. It is but the first rustling, but it is a superhuman rustling. It is supernatural only for the superstitious and ignorant. The spirit of truth is passing now over the face of dark waters and imparting them is compelling them to reveal their spiritual treasures. And this spirit is a force that cannot be hindered and can never, never be stopped.